Thank you very much for attending our webinar, Load Balancing Link in the Real World. I'd like to take a few moments to introduce our speakers and thank them for preparing a great session. First, uh, I'll introduce myself. My name is John Lamb, and I'm one of the co-founders of Modality Systems, a specialist provider of strategic and consult technical consulting services for unified communications technologies. In a past life, I spent nine years working for Microsoft in a number of senior product development and consulting roles, including the original team that developed the core components for Live Communication Server, one of the predecessors of Microsoft Link. Next up, we have Barkov Shukla, who's Director of Product Research and Innovation at Kemp. Prior to Kemp, Barkov worked in, at Microsoft with a focus on link and exchange deployments for enterprise customers. Barkov has over 17 years of industry experience in technology design deployments and management of various platforms. Barkov is one of the very few people in the world to, to hold the prestigious Microsoft Certified Master Certification from Microsoft Exchange 2010. Bargon's deep experience with Microsoft technologies and Microsoft platforms has enabled him to serve on the board of Microsoft Certified Architects for Exchange 2010. Bargov is also the Simon Cowell of PowerShell, serving on the judges panel for the PowerShell scripting games, which will be coming to prime time on NBC next fall. We're delighted to have Alex Lewis, who is Principal Consultant at Modality Systems, focusing on the design deployment of complex and large-scale communication solutions. Alex is a renowned product expert on Microsoft Link, as well as holding an MCITP qualification for Microsoft Link 2010. He's a two-time Microsoft Unified Communications MVP and the author of two books on Microsoft Link, Link Server 2010 Unleashed and Link Server 2013 Unleashed, which is coming soon. We're not sure where he finds the time, but in addition to all that, he's a PADI expert certified scuba diver, motorcycle racer, consummate food and wine connoisseur, and once beat Quentin Tarantino in a game of croquet. We're also excited to have a very special expert witness, as it were, John Brownhut, chief scientist at Kemp. John has over 25 years of IT experience with primary focus on networking and security. His former roles were Director of Information Security at the NYC Office of the Comptroller and served on the Banking Industry Technology Secretariat Advisory Board. John thinks LEGO Star Wars is underrated, Angry Birds Star Wars is overrated, and the original three Star Wars movies widely acknowledged as being the greatest films of all time, which of course they are, are neither over nor underrated. A special thanks to David Finkelstein at Kemp, who's the guy who ultimately responsible for sponsoring this webinar and making it happen. Thank you, David. Your ability to herd cats is commendable. The agenda of the uh, webinar will be as follows. Alex Willis will talk about the whys. Why do we need to load balance link? I'll talk about the what. What are the load balancing requirements for link and how it should be configured? Bargov and Alex will then cover the how by giving real-world examples and lessons learned. And at the end, we'll have John B. and Bargov tell us a bit about the Kim Load Balancer product line. And finally, we'll leave some time at the end for the Q&A. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Alex, who will talk about why we need to load balance link. Thanks, John. And uh, strangely enough, you don't know how true you were on uh, the Quentin Tarantino story. <laughs> Perfect, here we go. So why do we want to load balance link? One of the uh, things I hear a lot when I go out with customers is, well, I want to use DNS load balancing, so I'm not going to buy a load balancer. That's not really true. It's, uh, it's a great story, but it's uh, not entirely the case. With that, uh, you can have a choice. For SIP services, you can either use DNS load balancing or a hardware load balancer. But for HTTPS and HTTP services, a load balancer is absolutely required. So we can talk about what are link web services. Essentially, that's address book lookups, distribution list expansion, mobility, as well as services like Meet and Dial-in, which allow you to allow users to adjust their dial-in settings and join link meetings. Also, it often simplifies PBX integration with multiple mediation servers. A uh, number of times, we'll say, oh, we've got this great link environment. Oh, we've got this great Cisco or Avaya environment. We want to make them talk to each other. And unfortunately, those two teams never actually talk to each other in terms of integration. So what will happen is they'll say, oh, well, from my Avaya session manager, I need to create trunks to all of your mediation servers. That creates all sorts of licensing implications and adds a lot of complexity. Or I can create a trunk to a load balanced pool, uh, essentially a VIP on the load balancer, and make things a lot simpler. 
Um, external applications often don't understand DNS LB or, or treat it as DNS round robin, which doesn't work, especially when uh, persistence is required. There's, there are ways to make UCMA applications work with DNS load balancing, but by default, they generally don't, and third-party applications uh, that integrate with Link usually have a little bit of trouble. Um, that's certainly not to say all, and happy to take offline any questions you might have around specific applications, but in my experience, it's a lot easier to hand it a VIP than to tell it to talk to a Enterprise Edition pool name with multiples IPs assigned. Um, a hardware load balancer is the only way to get high availability for Link Edge services, uh, specifically PIC and XMPP federation and federation with people that are still on OCS or OCSR2. And I'll hand off to John Lamb, who's going to talk about load balancer requirements for Link, specifically around uh, technical level of what roles can be load balanced and why. Go for it, John. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Alex. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about the load balancer requirements in general. So what, you know, why do we need to load balance and, and what are the specific configuration options that we're looking for when we're setting up a load balancer for Link? So I think first off, the, the best place to start is to talk about which server roles should be load balanced. And uh, this table gives you a pretty good overview of the various Link server roles. Um, and then what load balancing topologies are supported for each of those roles. So highlighted in red are the uh, four main areas where we want to look at load balancing with Link. The first is Enterprise Edition front end server, servers in a server pool. Uh, the next is edge servers, um, followed by mediation servers, and finally a director pool. And a director pool is effectively the same as a Enterprise Edition front end server pool in terms of load balancing. So the configurations of those two will be very similar. So kind of diving into the, uh, the nuts and bolts of this, what are we looking for specifically? Well, with an Enterprise Edition pool, um, now in Link 2010, as Alex mentioned, we support uh, DNS load balancing. But there's one aspect of it that still requires a hardware load balancer. And that's for the web services component of, of Link. And Web services are used for a variety of things, one of which is address book download, the other is a, is a, a distribution list, list expansion, uh, the third is joining the meetings, so the click to join meeting URL, and then some of the mobility services as well use HTTP traffic coming into the IIS server running on the Enterprise Edition pool to uh, provide various services to, to, to the link clients. So specifically for external users, we want to look at load balancing ports 8080 and 443 for the external website traffic. Um, and because all of that traffic is going to be coming in through our reverse proxy sitting in the DMZ, typically an ISO or TMG server, but it could really be anything, it's going to look like it's coming from the same host. So we can't really use IP source address uh, based affinity here. We want to do um, set up a cookie-based persistent on a per port basis. So specifically, we want these cookies they must not be marked HTTP only, they must not have an expiration time, and they must have a tag in at the MSWS man header in the, in the HTTP request. And that's how we're going to route requests and ensure that, um, you know, that this, a single client is always going to be hitting the same front end server within the pool when going through the load balancer. Uh, the next thing is for web services internal. Um, here we're going to web balance ports 80 and 443 for that internal client web traffic hitting the pool. And here we can use source address persistence. So what we would do is look at where, where is the IP source port of the client coming in and we could be persistent based on that so that that client always gets to the same front end server. The exception here is for internal Link mobile clients, which is a new kind of concept that was rolled out after the initial release of Link 2010, but there's the uh, mobility server component that supports mobile clients. And we want to use cookie-based persistence here, and it's because of the way the mobile clients are first hit the pool and then are routed uh, externally and through the web proxy in, in all cases anyway. Um, and then one thing that a lot of uh, load balancer admins like to do is set really low TCP idle timeouts because generally speaking with, with typical web servers, um, you want to recycle sockets really quickly so that you don't use them up because uh, HTTP requests when, when just going to web pages are very short-lived. Um, however, we want a slightly longer TCP idle timeout here of at least 1,800 seconds. 
Um, and that's because the HTTP connections that we're opening for these various web services are, are longer lived than your typical uh, website request. And so that's one thing that catches a lot of people out and is important to remember. Um, moving on, there's some other, um, other uh, uh, servers that we want to look at uh, load balancing as well. Um, there's the edge server pools, um, which um, you know are, are a little bit unique because what we're really doing here is load balancing the AV edge on the external side. Um, and one thing that's really important to do in setting up load balancing for the edge server pools is that if you use uh, DNS load balancing on one interface, uh, you have to use it on both, and if you use hardware load balancing on one interface, you have to use it on both. So you need to match both sides of that edge server in terms of how you do load balancing. Um, when it comes to the mediation server pools, and remember mediation servers are the, 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 the entities that sit between link and the PSTN or PBX um, gateways on the telephony side uh, to provide um, audio transcoding and conversion from SIP TLS to TCP. Um, we can use uh, load balancers here in a really effective way, especially if our gateway or PBX doesn't support DNSLB. So it might be a PBX that supports SIP trunking, um, but isn't one of the certified uh, Microsoft Link um, PBXs or for, for direct SIP. Then we have, we have a pool of mediation servers. We definitely want to use hardware load balancing here because it's really going to simplify the configuration on the PBX to mediation server connection because we can just point the SIP trunk from the PBX to one single virtual IP address on the load balancer rather than having to worry if the PBX will support load balancing between two addresses on the same SIP trunk. Um, and here we want to use uh, source NAT or uh, full cone NAT or full NAT as it's sometimes called versus in the edge server scenario. We want to look at uh, using half NAT or DNAT, destination NAT for that AV edge. Um, one thing to point out is that when talking about these various load balancer topologies is that direct server return NAT is not supported with Link 2010. And direct server return is where the incoming um, side of the TCP connection hits the load balancer and then the server responds directly. Um, and that is, is not only a kind of a confusing um, topology to set up and troubleshoot, but it's just uh, not supported. So I would say that's to be avoided at, at all costs. Okay, so I'm going to hand back over to Bargov and Alex to talk about some real-world examples. Um, and I'll just remind everybody we have a Q&A session at the end if there's any questions. Thanks, Sean. So we'll talk about some real-world examples. Bargov and I have together, I would imagine, uh, probably around a quarter million seats deployed of OCS and Link. So with that, uh, we certainly learned a lot. And I, I like to call this part uh, the don't make the mistakes we've already made for you part of the session. So let's talk about some of the common things that, that we see um, and some cool stuff that you can also do with a load balancer outside of actual load balancing. Um, first one being HTTP to HTTPS redirects. Uh, there's certain misconfigurations on the link side uh, and certain integration scenarios where the client will actually be passed an HTTP link. Uh, a lot of times you want to force that to HTTPS. And it's easy to do that with a 302 redirect, and we'll talk about how uh, very quickly, as well as using the Loadmaster as a TMG replacement. Uh, for those who haven't heard, Microsoft has end of life to the TMG, or Threat Management Gateway platform. And with that, um, people are looking for, what do I use next as a, as a reverse proxy? And a load balancer is certainly an attractive option there, especially since you probably already have one. Uh, we'll talk about common load balancer misconfigurations, especially for people that may be a link engineer, but not necessarily a load balancer engineer. I will talk about load balancing best practices, some things that maybe aren't in the, the guides if you're, not, uh, if you're not used to using a load balancer. And we'll talk about common misconceptions. Uh, a lot of people have some ideas, positive and negative, about load balancers, what they do, how they affect the environment, and whether or not they should be used. So we'll talk about those, and uh, I'm hoping for a lot of feedback in the Q&A session about those. And finally, we'll have a discussion around DNS load balancers versus hardware load balancers for Link. This is probably the most common question when I do an architecture session. Uh, people love to say, oh, well, what should I use? And it's really not a clear answer. 
uh, but we can talk about the pros and cons of both. Um, and for more info, you can certainly go to the Kemp website and grab their Link 2010 Deployment Guide. It's uh, probably the most thorough guide I've found on any load balancer. Uh, we can go ahead and uh, flip off to the next slide, and I'll hand off to Bargov to talk about HCV to HTTPS redirection. Okay. Uh, so thanks, Alex. Uh, one of the common configurations, like Alex mentioned, is most of the times what you want to do is you want to take your service and take it from regular HTTP to HTTPS. Uh, sometimes it's because uh, someone typing the dial-in URL, for an example, just typed HTTP instead of HTTPS. And you want to take it and, and redirect it instead of forcing user to type it by giving them an error. Um, and and uh, as it showed in here, it's very easy for us to configure that in Camp Load Balancer. All you got to do is, as shown on the steps, uh, it's just two-step process where you're forcing an HTTP redirect and uh, configuring the parameter to take the host strings that were passed from the client on to the server, only changing the HTTP part to the HTTPS. And uh, because it's a 302 redirect, um, you will only see the redirect the client on their Internet Explorer or any other browser they are using will not see any change but automatically be redirected to HTTPS. And that's the only change they will see. Next slide. Uh, this one, we are talking about the reverse proxy. Um, the concepts of reverse proxy, if you have used TMG, would probably be a little bit clearer of what you're doing is you have this uh, server or device in your DMZ, which is interfacing with the clients, and the traffic then is handed off to the back end in link. Uh, it's, it's handed off to your front end pool in the back end, or if you have directors, it would be handed off to the directors. Um, Either way, since the TMG is um, is end of life, December 2012, uh, the biggest question for link reverse proxy is, what do we do uh, with uh, with it going forward? Um, if you don't have TMG and you're planning to implement it, that's where this question becomes the biggest pain point in your decision making. Uh, how do you, um, you know, what, what product do you use? Obviously, Microsoft only recommends their own products, and TMG is not uh, going to be one of them anymore. So uh, I want to highlight another uh, feature that we have in uh, Camp Loadmaster, which has been there for a while, actually, but it's, uh, it's a little known, uh, which is basically, if you think about that reverse proxy in stricter sense of how Link used to do the reverse proxy, or what it needed from TMG. Uh, basically, your clients are connecting to port 443 on HTTPS to the reverse proxy, whether it's a device or a TMG. And you are translating that to the port 4443 on the back end. Um, so in that sense, you can configure the load balancer to do the same, you basically set up the service. Uh, there are a couple things I've highlighted here, but let me just quickly go over um, the basics first. And you create a virtual service for 443, which is the listening port from the client side. So when client connects, it connects on 443. And as you see at the bottom of the screen, it shows where it actually ends up on the real server. So the real server in this case happens to be 172.16.101.130. But notice the port that's highlighted, which is 4443. So uh, that function is now handled by Loadmaster. Uh, the only other thing I want to highlight is the L7 transparency. If you were losing, uh, if you were using the Loadmaster device, uh, you want to uncheck that and make sure that the traffic is passed through to uh, the front ends correctly so that they see the client devices coming in and see the host headers coming in. Alex? Sure, thanks, Bargov. That was uh, some great stuff, and it's funny how often the HTTP to HTTPS redirect is is not not known, and I uh, people throw it in and think it's black magic, but really it's, it's not that difficult at all as you've shown above. 
So thank you. Right. And sometimes what happens is when you're looking at that redirect, depending on what device you use in DMZ, you might end up doing some um, funny regex stuff with Apache. And uh, if you're using IIS, you might end up doing the rewrites. Uh, however, this just highlights how easy it is to set it up in, in just one step. Agreed, agreed. And that's something I, I'm planning to talk about later is the, the ease of setting up a load balancer and how it really doesn't need to be uh, all that scary. So we'll talk about some common misconfigurations. And these are all things that, that I run into and see a lot. People are like, oh, yeah, everything's broken. We need, it's going to take a week to fix. No, nah, it really takes 10 minutes to fix, maybe an hour. And we'll look at kind of some of these. And these are very much a high level uh, ones we picked out, five or six out of probably four or five dozen uh, that the group of us here have seen. But leaving the timeout set as default. As much as this is called out on every load balancer guide for Link and on Microsoft TechNet, uh, nobody seems to to want to adjust the TCP idle timeout. It really does need to be set to 1,800 seconds. And John talked a little bit about why. Um, and some people got away with not having it set that way and it not being terribly noticeable until mobility came out. And then with mobility, it really started to show up. Um, so with that, we'll talk about uh, the next one, which not load balancing all ports for edge services. The edge services piece is a little different in the sense that none of the ports are actually listening until the link edge server goes over and says, hey, you know what, go talk on X port, um, which means sometimes the health checks will fail. So you look through and you have to make sure that you include TCP and UDP for 50,000 through 59,999. And yes, only UDP if you want to federate with PIC, uh, XMPP, or um, OCSR2 edge servers with partners. And make sure that the same type of load balancing, DNS load balancing, or hardware load balancing is the same on both sides of the edge. And there's two ways of doing that. One is obviously having a load balancer on each side of the edge. And I've seen it a lot where people will essentially VLAN off their load balancer and use the same load balancer on both sides. We can talk at length about the security implications of that. Um, but there's, there's multiple ways of doing it. And we'll leave it at that for the, the purpose of this discussion. Um, to cover again what John mentioned, in general, use SNAT for general services and DNAT for the AV edge. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of situations where clients coming through the edge and internal clients will never be able to talk to each other. And that's something I see fairly common um, tech net boards, uh, customers I work with, that it's, it's something as simple as that. Oh, we, you know, we created one pool, added all the ports into one rule, and called it a day. Well, unfortunately, it's not quite that simple. Um, as cool as the HTTP 302 redirect is, there's no need to do that for the mobility service. I see a lot of people coming in and saying, oh, well, I saw the, the Microsoft guidance was to redirect all mobility requests to the external URL. Yes, that's correct, but there's no need to have that redirect done on the hardware load balancer. It can all be done within the link front end. And in fact, it's automatic. And I found that it makes it a lot easier to troubleshoot any problems that arise if you do let the request actually get to the front end. And finally, ensure load balancer failover is correctly configured and tested before you need it. I've seen a number of times people said, oh, well, I thought I had it correct. And then we decided to do maintenance or upgrade software on one of our load balancers. And it didn't work. Well, that's why we test things and preferably don't test things in production. So one of the things I want to stress is part of every deployment make sure that you are testing the failover, whether that's a soft failover or a hard failover, um, before you actually put this solution in production. I would say probably failover is one of the, the most difficult things to set up correctly in a load balancer environment. John, if you could push me on to the uh, next slide, please. Perfect. Talk a little bit about link load balancing best practices. Create an independent virtual service for each edge service. Uh, covers, again, kind of what I said before is don't create one rule for all of your edge services. They are different. They get treated differently. And it makes a lot of sense to monitor them separately 
and to create separate rules. In the case of the AV Edge, it's absolutely required that you create a separate rule for it. Uh, and I found it makes everything a lot easier. Three services, three rules, and then you obviously have a separate rule completely from uh, your proxy. Use cookie-based persistence for your external link web services and source address persistence for internal link web services. In some ways, you can get away with other persistence spaces, and that's kind of outside the scope of this discussion, but that's a general best practice. The only gotcha is cookie-based persistence is absolutely required for link mobility services. Uh, you'll Otherwise, you'll see just random disconnects uh, happening very often, and push notification service will be spotty at best because the client will be dropping in and out. Um, to rehash what John mentioned, those cookies need to be marked HTTP only, specifically named MS-WS-MAN, and have no expiration. Uh, strangely enough, the spelling and the format of that cookie name is absolutely important for it to be recognized. Um, always use a hardware load balancer if high availability for XMPP, PIC, or Legacy Federation is important. None of those services support DNS load balancing or failover. They'll essentially latch on to whichever one they attach to first, and if that server's to die, they won't automatically fail over and you'll have to wait for a DNS TTL, and in that time, you'll probably find that your second servers back up. And this is kind of a strange one that nobody, uh, I haven't seen brought up in any, any blogs anywhere or anything else. Turn off TCP nagling for AV hedge ports. Uh, essentially, that results in a delayed ACK and a number of other issues, probably too long for the time that we have here. But a lot of advanced load balancers support Nagel's algorithm by default. And really, from a link perspective, and any RTP's perspective, it's really not a good thing. So we can talk a little bit about DNS load balancing versus hardware load balancing. And I, this is a very, very high level slide. Um, there are some specific guidelines that we can look at, a specific matrix, but to be honest, I couldn't figure out how to put these, how to put that matrix onto a slide without mm, end up being 10, 12 slides and kind of death by PowerPoint. But to talk kind of the, the pros and cons on both sides is DNS load balancing, the easiest one is easy server training. You do it in one place, you run it, it's graceful, boom. The, uh, another one is less complex. People think, oh, you know what, I don't need to do anything in terms of DNS or in terms of configuring a load balancer. All I need to do is set up my multiple uh, IP addresses for my pool name and call it a day. Well, you still need to do the the load balancing for HTTP requests, but that said, that's, that's pretty simple. Um, if, we, if we mention that HT, or, sorry, HTTP is the easy part of load balancing and the other parts of link are the more difficult part, sure, but uh, part of what I'd like to stress is it's really not that difficult. Um, some of the cons of DNS load balancing. Often third-party applications don't understand DNS load balancing, whether that's something like a, I don't know, a, a video gateway for interoperability or a custom UCMA application or any number of, of different things that want to talk to Link. They don't understand the concept of DNS load balancing and just grab the first IP. And those best case scenario, they'll do DNS round robin and I say best case sense of failover, that can also be worst case if session persistence is required. Me, as John mentioned, many PBXs can't talk to a pool of DNS load balanced mediation servers um, when these are co-located on a front end. Essentially, there's just no way for them to, to talk to a pool of them and keep that consistent. What they'll do is they'll just pop between the two and you'll see um, something like the PBX sending a session progress, and then the mediation service, why are you sending me a session progress? I, I haven't even seen an invite from you. Um, so it's a lot easier there to use a load balancer in front. And finally, down-level clients, um, OCSR2, uh, Pigeon, which is the unsupported Link client that works, or sorry, unsupported Linux client that works with Link uh, that I see uh, a lot of places, they don't support DNS load balancing. So they'll just grab a server, and then they'll treat it like DNS round robin. Um, so if you do have any down-level clients or non-Link 2010 or later clients, um, 
DNS load balancing may not be the best answer. Uh, pros and cons of hardware load balancing. It becomes very, very easy to take a partially working server out of commission. A lot of times the server isn't completely down. A service may be hung or only specific things seem to not be working. So it's easy to take it out and essentially stop CS Windows service and do a dash graceful and also take it out of the load balancer and that'll take it out immediately. Um, so if, you, if you're essentially in a server down scenario in a multiple front end pool, you can cut that uh, even quicker using the load balancer. Granted, it does take an extra step, which is, is a con, um, but in some scenarios it can be preferable. Um, support for all level clients, essentially anything that wants to connect to Link will work through a load balancer. And also HA for PIC, XMPP, and Legacy Federation with OCSR2. Um, cons, one extra step for server draining. Not a big deal, but it does mean that you need to hit one more device to do a, a correct server training. And additional working complexity to set up. I think this is a bit of a myth, um, but I do hear it a lot. Oh, hey, I don't know how to do how to do a load balancer, and I need to involve another team. Not really. It's really not that difficult, and um, we'll we'll talk about that in one of the one of the later slides. Actually, the next slide, um, and that's significantly deployment time. Uh, again, in all, for a single pool configuration, I'd argue that having a load balancer set up adds maybe an hour, uh, certainly less than two hours, including unboxing, to the configuration, which isn't really that significant. Um, and the last one I've heard is, you know, if I had a load balancer, I'm adding a ton of latency. We'll talk about that on the next slide, and John, if you could push me forward. Perfect. Hardware load balancers add latency. Uh, and I'm going to talk specifically to the Kemp load mal masters because we have the information here with uh, Chief Scientist John Braunhut and uh, Bargov, who's also an expert there. But these these are fairly generic uh, statements. The Kemp load master adds less than 10 milliseconds of latency to transactions. When you're talking about uh, people in multiple offices and, and part of the pluses of Link is being that you can be anywhere connecting into Link. Three to four to five milliseconds of latency are just negligible. They are not going to matter. They're not going to show up. And in anything but a the, being in the same office as the servers, you're likely going to see more variation on your WAN uh, than you are from adding a, a load balancer in the middle. Uh, most RTP and SRTP connections don't traverse the load balancer. So it's really not that much of a concern. You're not worried about any sort of delay with SIP connections outside of it being very large. Um, you're really worried about it for real-time media. So in two-party sessions, Link is generally peer-to-peer. -peer. Uh, we can talk about whether or not it's proxied through the edge server or not. But generally speaking, let's call it peer-to-peer. And when it goes into a conference, all conferences are locked to a single AV server. And the AV server role has its own methodology for load balancing. Essentially, it'll pick which one's least busy and lock the conference there. But there's no sharing. You could have four AV servers in a pool, and it doesn't mean your single meeting is actually stretched across those four. It just means it'll get placed on whichever one happens to be least busy at the time. Hardware load balancers add complexity and delay implementation. Uh, James Botham, who um, a pretty well-respected link expert, wrote this blog about how long it took him to set up a Kemp load balancer. And it said basically less than 60 minutes for an enterprise edition pool, no prior experience. I agree with that completely. With the number of customers I've worked with, a lot of times they'll say, hey, you know, we want you to set it up. I said, well, you know, how about I set up I set up the first part, and you guys set up the rest. And they're amazed at how quick it is to set up. That's actually, uh, without you know, plugging Kemp, that's one of my favorite things about the Kemp Loadmaster versus some of the competitors is it's really easy to set up. Um, and that's something that, that I find is, is really helpful for people that don't have a dedicated load balancing expert on staff. Uh, and finally, hardware load balancers make troubleshooting more difficult. 
I kind of scoff at this too. It's really the same process either way. There are occasional setups that do require a little bit more work. There's a load balancer involved, but it's not significant. Um, I've never seen an issue where I've seen it pop up and go, hey, you know what? If we didn't have that load balancer there, we would have solved this in an hour instead of a day. Um, I just don't think it's a, a significant factor at all. Um, and John uh, Bronhot, I'll hand over to you to talk about uh, why Chem Technologies is special in the load balancing world for Link. Hi there. Uh, this is John Bronhut. And uh, gosh, Alex, that was that was quite a formidable presentation there. Um, load balancers, both hardware, software, and DNS all, all have their place in Link. I, I think Chem Technologies and our our load masters do have a a special place in the uh, in the link load balancing ecosystem, and that's that's what I'm going to be talking about for the next couple of minutes. Um, the reason we're doing this presentation for you, good folks, is because we, we think we've got in the Loadmaster, um, and as Kemp, we think we we're the right company with the right product and and the right support to tackle not just Link, but really the the whole gamut of of Microsoft applications. Um, we've got over six thousand load balancers that are deployed for. Um, Exchange, Link, uh, SharePoint, terminal services. In fact, we were we were one of the first folks out of the gate with a full um, layer four and layer seven load balancer for um, terminal services and and RDS. And um, because we do derive a lot of our business from folks with a Microsoft focus, we 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 try to to take our product and and make it easy to use and, and given a lot of focus on, on ease of use and, and web configuration for the IT generalist. Um, a lot of a lot of folks that, that come to us really are, are wearing a whole lot of different hats, you know, the, the proverbial jack of all trades, master of none. And it's it's um, really important that we not require that people go to school in, in some, you know, city three thousand miles away with, with Bad climate, and you know, spend a spend a week out of town just to learn how to work a load balancer. Um, part of part of that that thinking of, of, of supporting the IT generalist is that we do indeed bundle uh, the first year of support with all our products. Um, yeah, we're going to make it easy to use out of the box, and if we've ever fallen short of that, um, we're going to give give people um, email, phone, forum support ways to ways to just you know, get it done. Uh, the load balancers that, that we make, the, the load master is actually a family of products that are, are differentiated really by, by feeds and speeds and, and not feature and functionality. If you look at some of our competitors' products, they, um, they, they'll go light on the features as, as you, you look at their smaller units because they're, they're looking to, to move people sort of up the food chain at all costs. Um, we've always taken a much more, more straightforward approach saying, um, you know, figure out how many people you're trying to serve, figure out the kind of throughput and kind of SSL transaction rates you need, and, and just, you know, pick the right size load master, knowing that you're going to have a full feature set, knowing that if there's rapid growth within your organization, you can um, move from one load master to the next because the, the configuration formats are, are all interchangeable. It's very much like a, a Cisco kind of proposition where you can, move configs from one Cisco rather than the next. And, and not only uh, across hardware models, but we also make uh, a whole range of virtual appliance load masters. And we got presence with, with Microsoft Hyper-V. We've got Hyper-V virtual load balancers. We've got VMware ESXi virtual load masters. And just recently, we introduced our Zen and KVM hypervisor versions, uh, again, would feature functionality parity across across all models. We are indeed the value leader when it when it comes to load balancing at camp. We and and this is something that the folks at Gartner tend tend not to recognize. They 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 count up bells and whistles and and, and give you a, a position in their quadrant accordingly and uh, EMA, the folks that did this radar report, they actually organized themselves a little different because they, they recognize that in the real world, um, decisions about load balancing are often budget constrained. 
And as, as this chart very clearly shows, um, as you move from left to right, you, you get more cost efficient and there is no load balancer on the market that is more cost efficient than the camp load master. <sighs> okay, so I guess it falls to me to tell you folks a little about Kemp. Uh, he's one of the one of the co-founders. Uh, we got started at the beginning of the century um, with over 10,000 customers worldwide. This is a little out of date because not only do we have headquarters in Limerick and and an EMEA office, pardon me, headquarters in, in New York and an EMEA office in Limerick, but we just opened our Singapore office, so we've got a We've got a leg in each of the major markets, and, and we're finally going to be uh, achieving our goal of full follow the sun support with uh, a guaranteed wide awake support person who's supporting you while while the sun is up, regardless of what time of day you're encountering issues. Um, we've had over 400 percent growth over the past half decade. Uh, we are the leaders in server load balancing for the small to medium business market space. That's that's really where we started. That's really our, our reason for being. Um, we keep on keeping on. Uh, we do layer four, layer seven load balancing. Um, we do SSL offload and acceleration. Um, not so much an issue with link, but if, for those of you who are also deploying, for example, Microsoft Exchange, um, there's a critical requirement there to do layer seven processing for for exchange 2010 and having a load balancer that has dedicated ASICs that allow you to really bump up the volume on on the SSL transactions to make sure that the uh, the load balancing you pick isn't going to be a bottleneck for for your layer seven SSL processing. Uh, we've got fantastic service awareness in our health checking this this isn't your 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 father's windows nlb with with pinging the servers and saying that's good enough um we are application aware we have a framework where you can really granularly specify the sorts of health check you need and uh and make sure the traffic gets delivered to a resource that's capable of handling it uh, ips uh it's a it's a dangerous world out there and for those of you who have um public internet facing deployments uh it's good to know that we can we can mitigate um by either logging or, or actively blocking all sorts of all sorts of ugly um malformed application layer attacks uh we got our start in in the http spaces as many load balancer companies have so uh http caching and compression is is part of our core competency and really extends the the value of a load master and, and in addition to just providing high availability and scale out um, actually improves end user experience um, on each transaction. Uh, single points of failure are no no attempt so every model is available um, to be paired as a, a active hot standby spare. Um, we've chosen the active hot standby approach rather than active active because if you're looking for high availability, simplicity and reliability is paramount and this is how you get it. Uh, because of our deep Microsoft competence, we've been able to provide application specific configuration templates. Uh, so that you don't have to, to do all sorts of little granular items. For example, I, I recall that one of the presenters mentioned the, the denagling. Um, if you set up for Microsoft Link on a load master, you'll you'll find that the the rel relevant virtual services are already effectively denagled through through these are our templates. And if, if anything I've said here has, has piqued your interest and you're interested in getting your hands on one of these bad boys, um, we've got a couple of ways to do that. Um, there are three eval hardware load masters available that you can go go to that link that, that we've got there. You know, click, 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 take a screenshot and, and go get that. Um, you can try out the load master in your environment. Um, 
absolutely no risk. Uh, if you don't like the color, and we, you know, some people object to our, our, our gold-colored box as well. That's, that's enough reason to send it back, but, but I'd ask you to sort of pre, pre-screen that objection and, and just give it a try. Um, or we can go for, for the entirely colorless virtual load masters. We have a virtual appliance that's also available for download for all those platforms that I mentioned before, the uh, uh, Hyper-V, VMware, ESXi, Zen, and KVM. And that's available at that link below. Or you can just go to the, the, the main homepage at www.chemtechnologies.com and you'll, you'll find the VLM downloads just, just one click away. And now I think we have reached the fun interactive portion of our program. Great. Thanks, John. So we'll open this up now for Q&A session. So if you do have a question, be sure to either raise your hand or type it in the chat window. And Dave and John will be helping us out triaging questions. And Bargov, myself, and John Lamb will be answering them for you. Okay. So Thomas Pott asks, regarding reverse proxies, uh, he's wondering where and how users can be re-authenticated. Sure, and I'll hand this uh, over to, well, actually, I guess I can take it. I was going to hand it over to Bargov. But in general, uh, Link doesn't, uh, doesn't do pre-authentication. What it does is it asks the user to come through and authenticate directly um, in a reverse proxy scenario. So if you're talking about Link explicitly, it's kind of a non-issue, but I assume that that question might be about exchange. So Bargov, I'll let you chat a little bit about how pre-authentication happens for exchange. Yeah, so um, pre-authentication, we normally see when we have the TMG scenarios. Um, I just want to also point out that uh, Loadmaster currently does not do pre-authentication for exchange workloads. Uh, but it's something that we are planning uh, to release soon. So it's it's in works and it will come the, your way. But going back to the pre-authentication, basically what that is is you're not necessarily offloading the authentication, but what you're doing is you're putting another layer between your servers that are on the internal network and something in DMZ. Most companies balk at the idea of passing unauthenticated traffic all the way through to the servers. So uh, it, thinking in the terms of, say, TMG, uh, you had that in DMZ, the traffic would come to TMG first. You're presented with your uh, forms-based authentication. You provide the authentication, and then the traffic is passed on to the server. It, that doesn't alleviate any load on the Exchange servers in that sense that the Exchange servers still have to authenticate your traffic and make sure that you're authorized. But the benefit here is that anything, any any traffic coming in through that reverse proxy layer in the DMZ, if that is authenticating and throwing out all the unauthenticated sessions, now you have that many less sessions going to your internal server, which also satisfies that need of the security organization asking only authenticated traffic be passed through all the way to the internal network. Uh, and Alex, you uh, you said it right on the link side. There is no um, no pre-authentication for link, even if you're using TMG. And it's well documented in TechNet not to do any kind of authentication on TMG. It has to be straight pass through. Great, thanks, Bargov. Uh, Dave, uh, next question. Okay then. Um, oh, softball from Daniel Lindman. He's wondering if Kemp is going to be supporting Link Server 2013. Uh, I will take the short version and then hand it off to my my colleague Bargov for more elaboration. Uh, that's a yes, Daniel. Bargov, take it. Yes, we will be supporting Link 2013. And uh, in general, we the... have the. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead, Alex. Oh, I was just going to say, in general, the load balancing requirements haven't changed significantly between 2010 and 2013. So I would say if you're deploying 2013 today, you could comfortably you know, purchase a load master and not have any worries. 
Yeah, and I, it, not that it matters much to people who are looking to deploy this in production, but I can say we have uh, tested it already and it works fine as is without any modifications to our current product line. Uh, it's just a matter of us getting the guidance published. Okay, actually, I, I see. I see that that, that Dan, Daniel actually gave us clarification that I, I hadn't seen when I first read that to you. Um, he wanted to know if it was being officially supported, and gosh, I guess, I guess I'd say it, it, it's it's supported, and 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 the documentation is in in active in active development. Um, uh, related to this, um, and I think we've actually covered this. Uh, Ope Babayami, I'm sorry if I botched your name. Uh, was asking if there are differences between load balancing Link 2010 and 2013. No, the the primary workloads um, haven't changed. The way uh, they work haven't changed between 2010 and 2013. 2013 does add a lot of new features when it comes to looking at um, you know the video and how it works and how it allows you to do a new uh, interface, but that doesn't change the underlying protocol workflow and because of that um, the product works with 2013 as is. Hopefully that answers the question. I can clarify if needed. Okay, that, that, that sounded good and if a request for clarification comes in, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, Stefan Rasmussen is asking, oh, great, great question here, um, if it's possible to use Loadmaster for both reverse proxy services and link edge services, and then he clarifies, can I use the same single load master for this, you know, or, or do I need multiple load masters to accomplish that? So I can take that. Go ahead, Bardo. Yes, so uh, the answer is yes to that question. You absolutely can use the same load master to do both functions. And with that, you can partition up all of the load masters, so even the most basic load master uh, has four physical ports that can each be placed on a different network and then within that network there can be multiple hosts on that network for multiple virtual services so there's no problem partitioning up your load master to be able to support multiple services you can even use the same load master for say link and exchange which is something I see a lot you don't need a, a load balancer per application uh, you partition it up as appropriate and uh, as long as it's appropriate within your security policy, you can put it on as many different networks as you'd like. Okay. Um, per Corlin is asking about HTTP redirection handling when two or more ports share the same edge pool. And he's wondering if making this work would require that each front end pool has a different reverse proxy DNS. Okay, I, I think I need to uh, clearly understand what the question is. Um, okay, let's when you see say there's more. Um, okay, no, he, he has clarified. Um, does there, ah, here we go. Will it read host headers to distribute HTTP traffic to pools like DMG does? Right, John, you might be best to answer this one. I know we do content switching, so. Yes, we do, because we, we, we've talked today, thank you, Bart, um, we've talked today about using Loadmaster and, and other, other technologies for load balancing. Um, the Loadmaster is actually a combination product. It provides both load balancing and what, what we've termed and, and others in the industry have termed content switching, which is actually directing traffic based not on some sort of leveling algorithm, but rather based on um, things like HTTP headers and, and URL characteristics, and that does include host headers. So there is today um, a way to, to, to read out, um, as I said, host headers um, and, and URL, URL elements and, and direct there. So you can indeed do that with a single namespace and and content switching. Huh, you know what? I've I've been I've been cherry picking softballs. I'm gonna ask a hard one. Um why didn't we use link for this meeting guys? Chef Jezik is asking. Sure this is this is Alex. Um and it's funny we had that conversation a lot internally too. And the way that it came up is 
from a webinar perspective and based on the fact that Kemp works for a ton of different solutions, so Link, um, Exchange, and a number of non-Microsoft solutions, uh, this was just kind of the standard for a large webinar. Um, we also didn't have to worry about having potentially 500 plus people um, eating up bandwidth. So while we could have hosted it certainly on, on Link Online, um, we wanted to keep with a standard format across all different products. Um, so as much as, as we're talking about Link today, uh, the Kemp folks may be talking about uh, something different next week or a couple of weeks from now uh, in terms of product. All righty then. Ooh, here's here's a here's a here's a hardcore Link 2013 question, uh, also from Thomas Pot. Um, in in Link 2013, if I have uh, M to N mediation pool two and a PSTN gateway, how would a load master load balance this? So, John, I'm, could you repeat the question? I'm, I'm assuming it means essentially how do I load balance multiple mediation servers? I'm talking to a media gateway like a, a NetSonus UX1000, but not sure. Yes, uh, right? Exactly. Yeah. No. No. That, that's yeah. That's yeah. Um. That's 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 okay. how that's how I'm reading it. There's a punctuation glitch here, but yeah, yeah. That, that's okay. sure. So, uh, really, what you do is you set up a VIP, and I don't have. You can set up the mediation ports to be whatever you'd like them to be. Uh, when you configure your mediation server, and you essentially just create a pool and a VIP, and you direct the mediation or excuse me, the media gateway to point at the VIP as its next hop, and you can point back through and have have it load balance between the two as long as there's session based some sort of session based persistence there, it'll be able to send it to always the same a mediation server, which is important for any given call. It's I would say it's conceptually probably one of the, the most basic forms of, of load balancing, just the ports are a little non-standard. And in yeah, the, Alex, this the, is, um, I'm sorry, Alex, this is John Lamb. It, I think it's it's simple because all you're doing is load balancing the SIP, SIP session rather than the media. The media is going to flow directly between the mediation server and the gateway. Exactly. And that's actually covered in the Kemp guide that's in the slide deck. Um, so if you get the Kemp Loadmaster guide uh, off their website, they actually do explicitly cover mediation servers. So if you are curious for more info, uh, that's a good place to find it. Okay, and and as is very often the case when whenever we do one of these presentations, we've had a few questions uh, specifically regarding high availability. Uh, Daniel Lindman again is asking if it's possible to have a clustered solution for HA using Loadmaster VLMs and not necessarily just the just the hardware appliances. Um, that one that one's real easy. Um, I I stated earlier, so when I, when I sort of played Pitchman, that um, we have full feature functionality across all products, and that does include uh, the HA pairing. HA pairing is available for all virtual Loadmasters on all hypervisors. And John, this is very tempting. This is where I would like to say no, buy our 5300. That's the only one that does HA, but we are not other load balancing companies. So our uh, philosophy is to have all of them with the feature parity. Gosh, yeah. Um, oh, here's a, here's a, you know, here, here's, here's, a, here's a different HA question from uh, Holger Bunkrat, who's asking about using two load masters for HA and placing each load master in a different VLAN. That's so the question is doing HA in two different VLANs? Yep. That's, that's uh, I, I like to answer that as I would say no. The reason I want to say no is because think of the virtual service that you're hosting. Your virtual service is going to a certain IP. Well, if you put another uh, VLM or LM of the HA pair into a different VLAN, how would that VLAN actually take that IP and make it live? And how will others go get to that IP, right? It's, it's, it goes down to the networking layer and the routing layer where it becomes very tricky. John, do you have anything to add? Uh, really, I, I guess what I'd say is that 
it, it one you know you're you're entirely correct to, to to focus on the trickiness. I guess I would say that when we got started in this, the the, the first priority and the, the 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 first design principle we had for the HA was to mitigate against hardware failures, and, and consequently the the design was that we're going to have identical network presence for, for both halves of an HA pair. So it was sort of sort of a baked in baked in architectural feature. Yes. And I mean if you were stretching the VLAN, uh, that that would make it technically possible because it's the same IP range, it's the same VLAN, it is just stretched. If it is two separate VLANs I would just say no. Okay, so I think I think this is going to be going to be the last one. This is sort of a, another country heard from, uh, which is from a Mr. or Ms. I can't tell because I just have an initial Flentke who's asking about Exchange 2013 and looking for when we're going to have a deployment guide. Um, we've committed to our, our good friends in Redmond that we're going to have that Exchange 2013 deployment guide by year's end. Um, but I will tell you that any load master you purchase today is fully capable of load balancing all the relevant yeah, and services. So, and I, just, I, I would just add to that that the deployment guide, like John mentioned, is being worked on very actively and will be out um, way earlier than what we committed to our Redmond friends. Uh, and in the meantime, if you are having difficulty setting it up, our support staff is happy to help you out, although in 2013, as you probably know, because you're asking the question, it's really simple to set it up. Okay. Um, wow, well, looks like we've overrun our allotted time by a bit, so I'm going to just throw this off to Alex for some parting words and final thoughts. Great. Thanks, John. And thanks, uh, Dave, John, and, and Bargoff from Kemp for setting this up. And uh, hopefully it was very informative for everyone online. And thanks, John Lamb, for making some time out of your day to join in and give some great insight. If you do have any other questions for the Kemp team or the modality team, um, both of our URLs uh, are pretty simple. KempTechnologies.com is a great way to get in touch with John. Bargov and the rest of the Kemp folks, and modalitysystems.com is a great way to get in touch with John and I. We're certainly happy to take any questions you might have offline uh, or any additional requests for information. Uh, please feel free to reach out. And thank you all, and I hope you have a great uh, morning, afternoon, and evening, depending on where you're joining us from. <laughs>